So today we're looking at um, triadic arpeggios, and we're going to look at just one specific one, the C major two octave triadic arpeggio. So watch the video for free, and you can just pick up the, the tips and the exercise for free. I'll even give you some notation for it. Um, but if you're interested, this comes from my technique book. Um, my technique book has hundreds of exercises for the right hand and the left hand. It has like 100 open string exercises and then the Giuliani arpeggios. And then all the scales and slurs and um, stretch exercises and things like that. But it also includes these triadic arpeggios. And one of the great things about um, studying triadic arpeggios and practicing them is that for one thing, you're playing music theory. I mean, triads are a big part of music, and I'll explain what triads are in a second, but they're a big part of music, and you want to understand triads on the guitar. I mean, piano players know it almost from the first lesson or something. Um, so you, you want to understand triads on the instrument. Um, another reason is from a technical standpoint, they offer something, some technique practice that is very similar to repertoire. Um, this idea, especially when you start in like first position, and then you shift to an upper position, and then you shift back, in this case on an open string, on that open E. Um, that happens in repertoire a lot, so learning to navigate the guitar is really important. So it kind of includes um, a lot of left hand work, including a shift, and also some, some discussion about right hand fingering and what fingering we can use because we often need to um, do some, some interesting right hand fingering. So all of those things combined into one little tidbit of technique is, uh, gives you a lot of ground, covers a lot of ground in terms of things to pay attention to and things to improve upon. So like, well, like I said, so there's lots of triadic arpeggios in my book and the the more of them that you practice, the more variety there will be in terms of different finger combinations, different solutions for the right hand. So you want to practice lots of them, not just one. But for the sake of this lesson, we'll look at the C major. Okay, let's take another quick look at the exercise so you can start playing it. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about what triads are, and we'll talk about all the, tech, the left hand technique and the right hand technique involved in playing triadic arpeggios. In order to play the exercise, all you need to know is like a basic C chord in first position, just like you're a folk singer's C chord. And then the shift up to the 8th fret G on the 2nd string, with the 3rd finger, and the high C. So it's this shape and this shape. You might want to just become familiar with this chord, and this. And then you just need an open string to transition between them. So, in terms of um, what triads are, triads are three note chords. They're essentially the building blocks of all chords in our tonal system. So, when you have a C major scale, do, re, mi, or, or let me use scale degree numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so you have eight notes in the scale, right, in the one octave scale, and the first, the third, and the fifth note create a triad, 1, 3, And then most chords, like when you have bar chords, for example, there might be more than three notes in that chord, but they're all made of those three notes if it's just a major chord or just a minor chord. So like in this chord, this is C and G and C and E and G and C. So it's all just C's, E's and G's in different combinations. It doesn't matter where you play the chord, it's just C's, E's and G's. So those are triads, three note chords that can be combined in other ways to make larger chords. And then we're playing them in order. So one, three, five, one, three, five, one, five, three, one, five, three, one. Those numbers again are the scale degree numbers, right? The first note of the scale or the third note of the scale. One, three, five, or C, E, G, C, E, G, C, G, E, C, G, E, C. So now let's
let's talk about the left hand work. So on a basic level, you just want to know the shapes. So like I said before, you want to know this shape, a C chord, and you want to know this G and C up here. From a technical standpoint, those are the two blocks of the left hand. And when I play it, you can see it. That doesn't mean that when you actually play the exercise, that you will only like kind of block shape your chord shapes. From a study perspective, that's a really good idea to learn the shapes, but when you actually play it, you're probably gonna let the E ring out for a second while you get the G individually, and then the C individually, the G, and then you have to lift for the open E, and then you're probably gonna get one note at a time on the way down, or get the first note and block these two together. So learning the block shape is often something we'll teach students at first because that's a very secure way of thinking about it and it just breaks it into two groups, right? Um, but from a more legato perspective, um, sometimes you have to put one finger down at a time. So that's the basics of the, of the left hand. All you have to remember is that that open string is when you shift. And when you shift your hand, make sure that your whole hand is shifting and that your thumb is staying aligned. Like my thumb is usually behind my second finger and so when I shift up, the arm just moves my whole hand up to this position. So it just moves the hand up like that. And then you get the shape, right? And you're utilizing that open string for the shift. So during the open string, while that open string is ringing, you're going to shift your hand up so that you don't have a, a block or a gap in your legato, right? Or a clip in your legato. So as soon as that open string is hit, now, that's when you need to shift. Same thing on the way down. As soon as you hit this open string, shift down. Keep that thumb aligned so the arm just moves that perfect hand position around the guitar. Don't let your thumb drag behind your hand, which is so common. And, you know, I'll occasionally even catch myself doing that. But you don't want that. You want, your, you want a release and your arm to just move your whole hand up there. And that way you're in a perfect position when you're here and a perfect position when you're there. You're just transitioning between two perfect positions. So that's the left hand. Now, in terms of the right hand, um, I've given two different right hand um, options in my book. So the first one just involves going finger by finger and dealing with awkward string crossings. And I would recommend that lots of students learn this, even if they think it's awkward, because it's good practice. It's something you might have to do in your repertoire. So I'm going P, I, M, A, which is very logical because those fingers are on those strings, right? And then M, A, M, A, M, and then A, M, I, A. So on the way up, we just have P, I, M, A, and the way down, A, M, I, P. But that turnaround is the tough part. awkward string crossing but I think it's important to practice it that way um, because you can't always be micromanaging your string crossings sometimes awkward string crossings have to occur just for simplicity's sake so if you're really good at them it won't affect your pieces the other way is probably um, more logical in terms of its um, working out the, the right hand fingering to have no awkward string crossings so this one repeats the thumb though it goes Thumb, thumb, or P, P, I, M, A, I, M, I, and then M, A, M, I, P. So on the way up, you're just kind of like locking these fingers into the top strings and going thumb, thumb, I, M, A, and then just I, M, or I, M, I, M, which is very ergonomic, and then A, P. A, M, I, P. Which makes a certain amount of sense. You end up in the right place. Um, the only thing that for some people is that double P can be weird, but you just do a double rest stroke. That's very light rest stroke. It's almost like sweep picking or something in an electric guitar. Because we run out of fingers, right? Unless we were to use the pinky finger, but we won't for the sake of being classical purists or something. Um, but I mean, some people have, have experimented with that. 
actually I made a mistake there. Thing is, I'm, I've practiced my awkward string crossing so much that even if I do something wrong, I can kind of play through it because it's like, I've practiced it enough that it's okay. I can trust my hand to finish whatever I'm doing. So um, I would recommend you, you get good at both of my fingerings, even if you don't like one of them. Um, in your actual repertoire, in your pieces, you can choose the, the one that's most comfortable for you. But in your technique practice, you might want to get good at both so that if you ever have to use one of those, um, that you'll be able to. So in our technique practice, we can't avoid things because we don't like them. We need to conquer them and make sure that we, we um, gain the skill so that we can use it at some point in our repertoire, right? So um, I think we talked about everything. We talked about the left hand blocks, we talked about the shift, and we talked about the right hand fingering. And like I said, every triadic arpeggio um, works out differently. That one works out really well because the shift occurs on an open string. And when we play our repertoire, we try to plan it out that we do our shifts on an open string. So much so that sometimes we will do the shift way earlier than needed just to utilize that open string as much as possible because it allows us to do the shift and also have sound ringing out during that open string. So it's very useful. So like I said, um, the more um, the different, the more triadic arpeggios that you practice, like in different keys, um, that one was in C major, but you could do one in A minor or G major. My book has um, a good number of them. I don't, I don't put too many in there, but I've got like three pages of it, or three or four pages of it, three pages of of different scales because you want variety because each one comes with a different right hand obstacle or a different left hand obstacle, and uh, finding the solutions to those will teach you a lot. Like if you go through all the pages in my book for our triadic arpeggios. You'll learn a lot about um, what fingerings I chose, and therefore, the more that you understand those fingerings, the more that you'll be able to um, approach your repertoire and your pieces and say, what kind of solutions might be available to me? Well, I could do an awkward string crossing, or I could do a double thumb, um, and then you can make your own choices in your repertoire. But you gotta practice a lot of this technique, so uh, just a lot of pages of technique in order to, to gain that skill. But the cool thing is, is that like learning pieces takes a long time, but learning like little exercises like this does not take a long time. So you can learn a lot of fingering solutions in a short period of time with technique practice. And you know, lots of people write into the website asking about how do you choose right hand fingering? Well, if you've practiced a lot of technique, then you've probably already seen all of the different um, solutions and reasons for different right hand fingerings already. And then you just apply that to your repertoire. You don't have to think about it too much because you know that there's awkward string crossings, there's these types of techniques and these other types of techniques. And then you apply the one that you think is most appropriate to the situation.